Hello, everybody. It's the Historical Gamer once again, but you can call me Matt. And today we are returning after a long hiatus to episode number 70 of the Single Malt Strategy podcast. Today I'm joined by my co-host Tortuga Power. Uh, You can also call him Eric. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing well. Awesome. Just hanging in there. Awesome. So happy to be back after I've been prepping all these funny jokes for like six months waiting for the next podcast and they're the absolute best, I can assure everyone. Okay. <laughs> and we're also joined uh, by our our guest today, uh, Youper. How are you doing, Youper? Yeah, I'm doing very well, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Well, welcome back. We've had you on a couple of times ago, but um, it's good to have you back. And today we're going to be talking about a, is it a new game, a new demo, whatever it is. We've been playing it a lot and we wanted to talk to you about it. But before we jump in to today's episode's topic, uh, what have you been playing lately, Tortuga? And I'm just going to keep switching back and forth on your name between Tortuga and Eric. That's right. Yeah, we probably should just mix the two into like Torteric or something like that. Tarek, that works. Ugh. <laughs> Torek? <laughs> what have I been playing? Um... A game I can't talk about, but I've been... I'm, I can't wait to talk about it. Um, I've been playing the original Warcraft series from Blizzard, just for fun. Uh, boy, it takes me back to the days when Blizzard was like good, and I can say that in every sense of the word. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I can't really speak for what was going on in their studio. Maybe things were bad even back then, just weren't reported, because there wasn't really the Me Too era, but... Anyway, I've been playing those classic Blizzard games, and it just reminds me of, first of all, it's a nostalgia factor, but I think those games, I'm still enjoying them today, and I, I think that's partly nostalgia, but partly really the gameplay is just, it's really good. Man, they did, they made great stuff. Blizzard used to be my favorite company, and this really reminds me why. Other than that, I've been playing this game that we're going to talk about, Arms Trade Tycoon, but I won't go into any details, so we can save that for the end. And High Fleet. I'm still playing High Fleet. A little bit, at least. What about uh, you, Youper? What have you been playing lately? You know, Decisive Campaigns Ardennes has kind of been popping up a lot on my uh, computer, as well as the new re-release of the Tiller titles under the Wargame Design Company. And that uh, kind of been filling out between those two. Actually, can you talk a little bit more about both of those things? Like, first of all, maybe just with the Ardennes, uh, I haven't really, uh, I've been meaning to play it, but I haven't, I, I mean, first of all, I love Vix games. Those, are like, they define strip wargaming on the computer for me. Uh, Advanced Tactics Gold is, I probably put, I may have put over a thousand hours in that game. And all the subsequent titles that Vic has released, Decisive Campaigns, Barbarossa, Shadow Empire, I mean, I love all these games, but... For some reason, I I like opened Ardennes and I was like, "What am I doing?" And I left. And so, please fill me in on what I've been missing. Yeah. So, it, from what I can tell so far, and I haven't jumped into the big scenarios, but uh, it kind of takes a polish that some of the the earlier games didn't have. And the art looks a little bit better. The game flows a little bit better. It kind of lacks that jankiness that it had before. And I mean, one of the things I really like is the traffic jams. So if you try to move all of your units along the same axis of motion, they'll get all bottled up and jammed up and they won't be able to move as well. And it's just, it uh, it really feels like the, the whole series is maturing into that one game. Wow, that's cool. So that's actually inspiring. Maybe, I mean, maybe even tonight I'll go back and load that up. And then, uh, so I, I haven't, I played some of the John Tiller games probably what, like a, a year, year and a half ago. They were acquired by essentially John Tiller offshoot company anyway, right? Um, I forgot the War Game Design Studio. No, is that it? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the one. It was uh, some folks that were putting uh, some polish on the Panzer campaigns and Panzer battles. And now that uh, John Tiller passed away, they acquired rights to all of the software and they're giving it a fresh pass. And uh, I think they're also getting into the squad battles and putting a graphical polish on that as well. Have you been doing any of the campaign series? Uh, I've done the Panzer campaign. Uh, I got uh, Stalingrad is kind of the one I, I'll play quite a bit. Does it have like the the campaign mode working or whatever? Because I was trying to do Shenandoah campaigns and like I could never get to the screen to choose the campaign. It was always just the the, mul- the individual battles. 
you know, I uh, have never tried it. I usually do the small and medium battles, and the campaigns tend to be, you know, an entire core army group, and it's just too much, too many counters in a tiller game for me. Yeah, that's why I was interested in Shenandoah because it's uh, obviously civil war, but it's it's more the battles are much smaller compared to like peninsula or wilderness or anything like that. No, no experience with that one, unfortunately. Okay, what would I UTC? What have you been playing? Um, I've been playing a fair amount of Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought because the day that I feel like you thought would never come has come, at least in theory. Uh, the campaign has come out, although I, I, I'm using air quotes. A campaign has, coming, has come out for the game, so you can now actually play where you're the head of either the British Empire or the German Empire, or the German Empire's fleets design ships, build ships, and then fight them against each other in a war. It's nothing like what the final campaign is supposed to be, right? There's no peace. There's no inner war period. It's just Germany and Britain. You know, the rest of the world isn't in it. Um, and at least according to the dev diaries, uh, even the way that like ships run into each other is nothing related to like what the final version of the game is going to look like. It's basically like... They took the random battle generator from Rule the Waves and just copied and pasted that into their game. But it does let you fight battles and it does let you design ships and it gives a little bit more meaning to the ship design in the game. And so I've been playing that a fair bit and, um, you know, it's been it's been enjoyable. Oh, so you find it enjoyable because I, I kind of bounced off it. I mean, I'm spoiled from the fact that I'm playing constantly. I didn't mention this, but it's basically a constant game I'm playing is Rule the Waves. I probably don't go more than a week or two weeks without playing Rule of the Ways. I just I'm constantly playing it, and it's just such a such, such a. Unfortunately, I, and I don't think this is even surprising for the Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts people because they know this is early access and all that. Um, it's just such a less fun experience to do Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts campaign compared to doing what Rule of the Waves does. It, it just does it better in every way. It's it's really hard to to get myself to play. It's just something I, I want to force myself to do from like a press standpoint. So I'm like staying knowledgeable about the game, but it, it's a burden. You think, I, you and think I'm surprised the that, rule, of the waves campaign is better once you're at war. Cause I feel like it's literally carbon copied. Like once a war starts, it's the exact same thing, except that you get 3d graphics in your battles. Well, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. That's which is funny because like the war the wars and rule, the waves are the worst part of the game. Like, best part is just designing ships in the inner war period yeah okay so one one great thing about ultimate admiral dreadnoughts is they have an auto resolve which rule the waves does not of course i've i've made my own I, this is a, it's actually a well-used mod maybe i don't know how popular it is among, but one of the most popular mods for the rule the waves i think is my auto resolve simulator <laughs> so it's nice that the dreadnoughts has that focus because rule the waves clearly their focus is on the tactical battles like the whole rule of wave structure is like an excuse for tactical battles. So I, they don't have the same focus that, I mean, I prefer actually the strategic game. So it seems like Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts might be more up my alley. At least the developers are singing more my tune. But until the, I don't know, until the, the ship design and all that, I don't, it just wasn't fun to me. I don't know why. And I have fun designing ships for the, for the like one-off Academy missions. See, I find the Academy missions completely underwhelming um, because I have no, like, there's no context to it. I guess what, what I'll say is I've been moderately enjoying my time. I think the wars become a slog after a while because there's only one war and there's, I'm not even sure how, like, how do I get to a victory? I don't know. Just some, like, arbitrary, there's no context to anything. Um, but it gives me more context than the Naval Academy gives me. And so I've been... Enjoying a change of pace, if you will. Um, I, I think in terms of its faults and limitations, I think it has most of the same problems that Rule the Waves does as a campaign. And I think Rule the Waves gives you some extra detail and certainly more context in, in the war itself. But I did find it interesting that they basically carbon copied the like battle generation system because that's like the worst part of, of Rule the Waves. That's probably true. Fair points. But with that being said, um, so that's what we've been playing lately. Today we have an episode that we're going to be talking about a game called Arms Trade Tycoon. And this is a game that is only available as a demo, so it's not the final version of the game yet. It's being made by, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, is it Fun Guy Games? Like G-I, I think? 
and it is it was recently announced and this is actually something that's kind of been around in the ether for a while and i've been loosely following it um they've been announcing that there was a kickstarter coming and they've been posting occasional screenshots and saying that they're working on a demo for folks and so i was in their discord uh it's been at least a year or so and um the reason is it, it was basically the exact same concept of game that i had sort of pretty elaborately whiteboarded if i was ever to get into game design or development and to like make my own game it would be this exact game except for aircraft or ships instead of uh instead of tanks and um but uh they they announced what was it like three weeks ago or so um that they were signing with microprose and so they now have a publisher that is microprose and that makes it seem like the game is far more likely to come out um right now the steam page says it's coming out in 2023 we'll see hopefully it's not that far out and they're also running a kickstarter which i know we want to talk about a little bit later but uh, Tortuga, why don't you tell us a little bit about Arms Trade Tycoon Tanks? What is the game, and uh, and what do you do? Well, to steal Uper's uh, phrase, it's basically Rule the Tanks. It's <laughs> for people who are familiar with Rule the Waves. It's a very similar thing where you. I mean, I guess the focus is a little bit different. Um, you research technologies, and then that unlocks parts for you. You engineer those parts by you know, tweaking them. You design a tank, and then you take that you take that tank, you like submit it as a bid for uh, a government. In in the only, in the demo you play with the the British, so you submit it to the British government when they have a contract proposal window or experimental contract that you can send some tank design in for. And then if you win the bid, uh, ultimately for the actual fulfillment contracts, you actually need to build the tank, and then you sell it to them. And that's the game loop. You design a tank, you research stuff, you design the tank, you pitch it to the government. If they buy it, then you can sell it. You need to build it and you sell it for money. And it is, I, I hope I'm doing it justice. I'm simplifying and this, this, I, I guess that is the main game loop, but it is a blast. I had a lot of fun with it. You, you were actually a, a tanker, weren't you? What do you think about the game? You know, I was a tanker um, in an Abrams, not a uh, male British tank from 1917, but you know, it was interesting and they captured a lot of the things that made the tanks of the era unique and interesting, at least the things that a person would really recognize. The naval guns, the design flow, I mean, that all works and it all fits. So I think just from a flavor standpoint, it feels pretty good. I kind of worry when the game gets a little bit further along into the 50s or the 60s when the technology really started to change, but uh, it felt pretty good for a, a 1914 game. And I think that's worth calling out. So right now the game is available for free as a demo if you want to download it on Steam. It goes through, what is it, like September of 1914, I think? Yeah, you end at the end of October. So basically you've got a little bit less than a year. And so you're only going to be able to build a couple of tank designs, maybe sell one or two of them. I mean, it took me a good, what, two, three hours to get that far? So if this game is intending to go like into the eighties or something like this, that's going to be a long game. It might get, it might become a little bit of a slog because I, because I could definitely see this being a very repetitive process, but I really enjoyed, like they have a lot of research trees. If you want to research different technologies or different holes for your tanks. Um, I think the bidding process is, is pretty neat. It is rule the tanks in the sense that you're designing tanks and then getting to see how they fight on a battlefield. But it's kind of like rule the tanks meets, I don't know, Alfred Krupp or something, right? Because it's a business sim, fundamentally. You're running a business and your goal is to make money. And the way you're making money and running your business is in the military industrial complex and supplying tanks to your government or potentially in the future of the game, uh, other governments, you know, like export deals, I assume. So I think it's really interesting. You know, there's some ahistorical stuff. They weren't obviously building tanks and designing tanks so that they were ready at the outbreak of World War I. Um, but, like, you even get to see your tanks fight. You don't actually get to fight with them, but you get to see your tanks fight when the war starts and the regiments with those tanks deploy. Um, and it goes around to the different battlefields, and, and you get a fair amount of information about those tanks and what's working and what's not. Um, you have a bunch of different traits that you have to try and uh, sort of optimize with your tank. 
Um, you have to put your tanks through trials, you know, to see how effective they are outside of like combat. So I think there's a lot of interesting elements to this game. I do worry they're trying to do a little bit too much. I mean, I think if they started this game in the thirties, even, um, you know, there was so much evolution that occurred between the wars and, and, and during world war two that it could work well there too. I do wonder, Youper, to your point, how that really works when you start getting into technology. Like, you probably have to have parts of the game that roll on that don't even exist early in the game, especially from an R&D perspective, once you get into the 50s and 60s and 70s. But I don't know. I've been really enjoying myself with this either way. And you mentioned one thing that uh, is pretty cool, I think bears repeating, is uh, you send your tanks. First of all, you have these contracts which have particular needs. Let's say Firepower Soft. Uh, whole strength or protection, whatever it's called, uh, mobility. And your contract, your bid is graded on those things. However, the battlefield doesn't care what your tank was supposed to be good at. It's just a battlefield and your tank is just run through the battlefield. So the things that it may actually encounter on the battlefield might be different than what the tank was requested. And the cool thing is you can actually build a really efficient tank for the contract. You can win the contract by like, like just sacrificing on the things the contract didn't ask for. And then that tank will be a total turd on the battlefield. So you have this a little bit of like, I don't know, I'd call it for like the, the business person versus like the national like loyalist type person who is actually trying to build a good tank for the, for the field. I don't think that there's going to be a, a situation where like the allies lose, <laughs> the Entente loses World War One because your tanks are terrible. But it's pretty cool that your tanks are actually performing on the battlefield. And I noticed, because I've played through the demo uh, multiple times, the first time I played through it, I just was trying to win the contract, uh, make the most money and all this. And then the second playthrough, I was like, no, I actually, I, because your tanks on the battlefield, when they actually go onto the into these fights, they get a reputation. Um, like if they win battles, then the reputation goes up. If they lose them, it goes down. So in the second playthrough, I prioritize kind of like more of like a, uh, more like I'm fighting with the British. I'm trying to you know do good for the for the country type thing, and I tried to make a really outstanding tank, which also could win the bid. And then I mean these tanks were doing really well on battlefield, but I didn't make as much money because my margins were cut down because I was making better tanks. So, anyways, it's really cool that the game offers those two options. Like it's pretty cool <laughs> to me at least. I get really excited about it. I did that by accident. I was trying to research a medium tank or a cavalry tank because I thought I was going to get a chance at that contract, and I didn't. I missed it. But then it was the only thing I had, and I had already produced like 20 of them to try and get ahead of the deadline um, because basically like once you accept a contract, you only have so long to produce the tanks. And I find usually by the time you accept the contract, you're already kind of like if you don't have some tanks already in, the, in, in production, you're not going to be able to make enough of them in time to meet the contract. So I, I started building these, these medium tanks and then realized I didn't get the bid for the, for the medium tanks. So I had all these medium tanks sitting around and then they issued another bid for like a heavy tank that was meant to go against enemy tanks. And so I submitted my tank for the bid. Somehow a machine gun only tank won a bid of a heavy tank. And so I was charging like the heavy tank rate for tanks that cost like one third of that to make so i was charging the government like twelve thousand or whatever per tank um when the heavy tanks usually cost around 10 to make but this medium tank was costing me like four so i was just raking in the cash uh, at that point but i didn't get to see how they fought because the battle or the the demo ended before i was able to see them in combat yeah it'll be pretty cool to see how the how that like the long-term repercussions there's even like a point in the demo i think i think it happens every demo but it might be just random where the like the germans contact you and you have a chance to like kind of like sell them secrets i don't think that plays out like in great detail i think it's just kind of a one-off event where you're either found out or you take the money and you aren't found out but i can see that that whole thing where you're actually eventually hopefully bidding like okay so like argentina and brazil when when can you like license them tanks i mean there's just so many different angles they could go that I'd be excited to see. I really think a game like this makes a lot more sense era wise in the cold war, because you have so much more like arms exporting going on. If you're, if you're building tanks in the, in the fifties and sixties, you probably want to sell them to Israel, right? Cause they fight a whole bunch of wars with, with foreign made tanks. 
um, or Syria or Egypt or whatever, but then you're also still making them for your home country. From a tycoon perspective, I think it kind of makes more sense like World War II to, to modern day as opposed to World War One. But but either way, I mean, they apparently have very ambitious goals because their their thumbnail on their Steam page is Abrams as well as as well as British Mark One tanks. So one thing that kind of jumps out at me is they're basing the assumptions on what we know that works today. But in 1914, when they were trying to figure out what a tank was going to be, I mean, you got some ridiculous designs, and I would love to be able to make tanks that are just over-the-top, ridiculous, tri-tracks, boat turrets, I mean, just wacky stuff. I mean, they we know today that that wouldn't work, but back then, nobody knew, and I think there's a lot of uh, interesting creativity sort of stuff that can come down the pipe with this game. Well, and they could guide you along those lines, right? Because over time in the game, you'll see things pop up where it says, like, the British are looking at this doctrine, and they're looking for these types of tanks, or this is sort of their idea and what they're thinking. The game could guide you toward more things we know. Maybe, oh, this probably won't work. This is what they're looking for. So maybe you build to the requirement versus what we know is a good idea. So I think the game can kind of help guide you toward not doing stupid things, But being a little bit more experimental, multiple ways to win the contract, because I think that, you know, that's a core part of the game is it's not just I'm going to min max my tank. But as you said earlier, Tortuga, it's about you've got to win the contract. You might know, hey, this is this infantry assault tank that's, you know, going to be super slow and it has very poor anti-tank capabilities. But they're saying it's fine because it's only ever going to go in support of infantry. Maybe that's a bad idea. Or even like the Stuart light tank for the Americans in World War Two, the idea of that not really needing to destroy enemy tanks that didn't work out so well in North Africa. Um, So, you know, I think the game could, could direct you in some of these directions, depending on how they handle those, um, those contracts. Uh, Somebody mentioned in the comments on my, on my videos that there was actually superior uh, tank designs made before the, the Mark one and all this that were just rejected by, I think the first one was the Austro Hungarians actually had a, a tank design was actually a better tank design theoretically whatever by whatever metric that's measured uh and then this mark one comes along and it's like it, it's still successful but just tr- i'm basically trying to say that i agree with you per um because they do they railroad you and that's that is a bit unfortunate i mean they basically the contracts that you're for the parts you you have access to you only have one really for any given contract there's only really one way you can satisfy it i mean it's pretty obvious the way they want you to satisfy it and it would be nice to give the player more options, essentially just echoing what Uber said, that if, if, we're, if we have more variety, um, a little more freedom to even to make mistakes and stuff like that, that would be fun. Now, the game is only a demo right now, um, and it, it's interesting to me because on the same day that they announced that Microprose was going to be their publisher, uh, they also announced that they were going to be doing a Kickstarter, and... That kind of surprised me. What What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yes, it is very surprising. I, I it's the first time I, I mentioned this a few times since. I actually was seeking Microprose's uh, feedback on this. Uh, I don't think I ever got something which really uh, explained it all well to me. But I, I at least asked, "What is what is a Kickstarter?" I mean, it's the first time I've seen a Kickstarter and a main like big name publisher together at least for digital games people have come back and told me oh yeah this this happens for like board games for tabletop and there is i guess a physical component to this they want to like for some tier whatever you can get the physical copy of it but i think that by and large almost all the development resources are going to be going into the the software version so i'm not really sure how that works like what is what is the Kickstarter? I think it might just be a marketing ploy, or is it like a, a test the marketability or the potential demand for the game? I don't know. Yeah, I'm behind marketing because, I mean, you look at their what they're looking for in the Kickstarter, and there's no way you're going to make a full-fledged AAA game for ten grand or whatever it is. So it's almost like, hey, look, we're funded on day one, and... Look at all this cool marketing stuff. And they're just using it just to kind of pump the name, which, hey, that's cool. But I don't know. You sign with a big name, and that's kind of the benefit is you don't have to go with your hand out on Kickstarter. Well, but the weird thing to me is on the Steam page, they say, 
you know, you're going to have multiple tank schools. They talk about some of the engineering, the tank design, but then they also like make it pretty clear in both the demo and on the page. Britain, France, Russia, Germany, and the U.S. are are tanks that, in theory, at least according to the way I look at this and what I see when I play the demo, are going to be in the game. But then you go into the Kickstarter, and the Kickstarter has Germany is going to be part of the game at forty five thousand dollars. So, like, they have this base level of funding of ten grand. Then the second level is Germany, which is forty five thousand. Then they have the U.S., which is the third stretch goal. The USSR is the seventh stretch goal. France is even further down, and they've got a whole bunch of other stuff like different factory looks, three D factories, like armor trees. 3D, 3D modifications, tank trials, which like tank trials are part of the game. Now they haven't really elaborated on what this means because it's all locked right now. They're going to make the tank trials like a, a 3D arena where you can watch your tank actually go through its trials. But to me, a game like this, like if you're not even going to include, I mean, I guess France, whatever. They're not really known for their tanks. Sorry, France. Um, but No, man. That, <laughs> oh, I, I disagree, man. I think that France would be a really interesting, especially because French tanks, like look at in World War II, the French, the start of World War II, the French tanks were probably the best tanks in the world, weren't they not? Oh, absolutely. The S-35 Samoa was a, an exceptional tank. It was a doctrinally you know, handicapped, but there is nothing wrong technically with the tank. Okay, but you can't have USSR be like presumably 100K into the stretch funding. I I don't know. (laughs) To me, the USSR, especially since the game does appear to have the desire to go toward the Cold War, I don't know how you could have them not be in the game, you know? I mean, I completely agree, by the way. I I just don't think that you can even eliminate France is basically it. I think that the, the minimum viable product, in my opinion, for this game has got to include the big nations, which I would say is the United States, France, Great Britain, Germany, and Russia slash USSR. If it doesn't have those, then I I don't know. It it doesn't like though each uh, each of those, and you probably should throw Italy in there too because they have some pretty interesting tank history. But if you at least if you cover those, each of those has such an interesting tank development history at different points in time. It's just weird to me because like it's the stretch goals have so many different tiers and so many different things they're going to talk about unlocking. But then when you play the demo, it's like it's already there. Like it it appears the way they position the demo. That's the intent for it to be in the game. It's almost are they still going to do those other countries regardless of what the Kickstarter gets? Is what's the intent of the Kickstarter at that point? I don't know, but they, they've been really cagey in the in the Discord about whether other countries would be included if they don't hit this the stretch goals on Kickstarter. Well, maybe it's one side it uh, comes out on release, and on the other it's a DLC package or something like that, which I wouldn't be opposed to. I mean, you want to make Russia in 1918 a DLC? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no, I think a DLC would be perfectly acceptable for that, especially since there's so much time behind even just getting it 10 months into the game. Um I could definitely see doing breaking this up as DLC. I personally, I think DLC would make more sense to be like expand the game to the cold war. And here's all these additional features we have to add to make modern tanks in this game. Um, I think I'd cut it by time rather than country, but that's just me. Well, I don't know how his, so they right now the campaign has only a, a historical option, but there's also a sandbox option. Are they planning to do, is it going to be everything historical? What What do we do in between 1918 and 1936? I mean, is it, is this, I mean, if it takes us so long to go six months in the war, maybe those are the mechanisms so it speeds up like in between wars. Um, but I, I didn't get the feeling that that would be the case in this. I, that certainly is true in like rule the waves when you're not fighting tactical battles. But the speed up in this game, since you're not, everything's basically auto resolve, if you'd like to think of it that way, there's not really a huge speed up, um, I think, in peace or in terms of war. Like the few first few months of the demo before you're in World War I are pretty slow. I mean, I enjoy it, but you wouldn't want to play a game at that pace all the way to like 1936, right? Yeah, they'd have to alter the pacing in a interwar era. Otherwise, like you said, you're clicking along in 1924, just researching tech and doing nothing else. It just wouldn't be terribly engaging. I mean, if they would allow things to be ahistorical, that could be interesting. Because then, I mean, this is a little bit along the lines of what I think it was you were saying earlier, that 
we didn't know what was what was going to work and you know a lot of different designs we also they also didn't know when the next war was going to come so not like 1925 was still a very good time to be developing good tanks if you're if you're not sure when the next war is um of course if you're us <laughs> they're like oh yeah, let's just take a hiatus until 1930 and we'll just catch back up then but you know they didn't know that yeah, no, I mean, that's true. I think you probably change the pacing or the, the turn length is probably the better way to get at it. But like you just allow random, maybe they can somehow allow for random wars. I mean, this that's the glory of Rule of the Waves, right? You aren't stuck in the historical campaign. Now, although I enjoy the historical campaign, it's probably easier to script for them, too. I mean, the game does say, and it's about the game, every business you engage with and will affect your company and change world history. Yeah, I don't... So I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's true, at least in the historical campaign. I feel like it's going to be on the rails. I mean, the demo certainly is, but if you if you build the greatest, if you build the Tiger tank in World War One, no, that'll just break down and we'll never get to the battlefield. <laughs> never mind. Bad joke number one. Got it. Oh, I laughed, but it wasn't pushing the top. Same here. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Thanks, guys. What's well, on the Audacity, so you know. <laughs> Uh, Amplify it. Puts a little laugh track in there. <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't have a lot else to say. What does anybody else have to say? You know, I think it. Uh, there's so much potential here. I always looked at rule the waves and thought, man, the like rule the airplanes and rule the submarines, rule the tanks, rule the whatever. Like it was a franchise that was ripe for the picking, and it just was like crickets. And now to see somebody expand on that. I even look at the way that the the title of the game is Arms Trade Tycoon colon Tanks. To me, that says down the road we're going to have Arm Trade Tycoon planes or whatever we might have. So there's there's potential for growth here, and I'm really hopeful that we're going to see more come out of this. Yeah, I mean, I think everything that makes this interesting would apply, especially to aviation. Right, almost the exact same historical arc. You get the really primitive stuff out there that's important, but not really ready in World War One. Things really mature in World War Two, but then even post World War Two, as technology starts to really evolve and you start getting computers and other things like that into the tanks, then things just dramatically change by the late Cold War. So I think aviation would work really well for this. Similarly, you have a lot of different doctrines, whether you're talking about the bombers or you know, the, the U S tended to historically focus more in the interwar year on our interwar period on tactical, uh, attack as opposed to the British who were much more interested in strategic. I just, I think there's a lot of interesting parallels. If you look at aviation, um, and, and ship and naval combat too, you know, running your own shipyard could be really fun. Um, so I, I certainly see the same thing where I see, you know, arms trade tycoon tanks. That's an opening. If this, if this goes well to have, additional games on different topics um and you might build your own corrupt empire yeah you know well, arms trade tycoon nuclear weapons arms trade tycoon the food supplier there's a lot of different angles they could take on this one the food supplier was that one of your jokes you know somebody makes those mres and how does a troop perform based on the quality of the food in there i don't know could be could have an impact the who makes these boots Maybe the uniform. Well, then they can just rename it what I was going to name my game and just call it Military Industrial Complex. Which one of you is going to plunk down uh, $8,740 to be the tank designer? The what? Is that a Kickstarter goal? Oh, yeah. What do I get for that? Uh, You get everything as well as uh, you get to bring your own tank design, and they put your stylized photo, your name, and story in the game. And you reserve... You will receive a well-deserved fame as a true tank designer. <laughs> if I'm about to put almost $9,000 into someone else's Kickstarter f- to put my own tank design in a game, I mean, I know I won't get a game built for this amount, but I'd, if I have just that kind of disposable money sitting around, I'm probably looking at putting a little more and like starting my own gaming company. <laughs> You know, for $9,000, you could probably buy a pretty sweet chassis and make your own little sheet metal tank in your backyard. Ooh, good idea. You can just drive down the street and people freak out. Oh, that'd be awesome. You think I could make a Mark uh, whatever, like the, the really tiny French tank, not the Mark, whatever the the early French tanks were with just the machine gun on it. You think I could make that for like 20 or 30 grand today? Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt, 20, 30 grand will totally get you a little tank. 
Hell yeah. You guys want to give me 20 or 30 grand? Cheaper than a car. <laughs> Drive it to work. I was just going to, I was just looking at these stretch goals too. And oh man, I just, the thing is, this gives me PTSD because Star Citizen was something I really hoped would, would work out. And then I, I don't want, I wouldn't say that everything which has very ambitious stretch goals is doomed to, to be like Star Citizen. And God, I hope not. But these are some very ambitious stretch goals. And I like, honestly, even if they make, a billion dollars on their Kickstarter. I don't think I'd want to see some of these things put into the game that would just bloat it. Like, control your tank? No, I don't want to take full control of your tank on the 3D battle. I don't want that. That's not what I want. That's just going to make the game worse, in my opinion. So, hopefully somebody is analyzing whether or not these things are, are actually good things to add. Like, PvP mode? Test your tanks against other players? Okay, well, maybe that's okay if it's just like a you submit a design to a random simulator and it, it tests some, but yeah, I don't know. It, hopefully they can make all the nations and they can fill out the interesting tech trees, but like the core gameplay that is already there, I just feel like they need to expand upon, just fill that out. Give us the different nations, the different tech trees, make it for a long period of time. Uh, and, I, I don't think we need 3D modifiers. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> so anyway, that's my opinion on this. Uh, I by, I think that the game, by the way, the demo itself might be my game of the year for 2021. I liked it so much. And I, that's probably because I do like games like World of Waves. And this is, it's, you know, barking up the same tree. So it's it's a very good game. To me, what I like about this is it takes the military side of things and then combines it with something like game dev tycoon, right? Cause like, that's the same concept game dev tycoon, this game that's out there. It's a tycoon game about running your own game developer studio. You start in the early days of video games and go through to the present day and technologies evolve consoles evolve and you run your business and you try and make a product that sells and is successful. It's taking that exact same biz dev game idea Except, again, now you're a military contractor instead of a video game maker. And so there's a lot of tycoon games out there that do these similar kind of things, but I've never seen one about the military. There's a game called Sprocket that lets you design your own tank in a very kind of finicky way. But even that game, it's not about running a company. It's just about, like, building a tank, like, theoretically, and then seeing how it fights on the battlefield there's no business management thing. Like this game even has, you've got to buy high carbon steel. You've got to buy iron. You've got to buy rubber. You've got to buy, um, I think just medium carbon steel. Like you've got to buy all these different components and manage your logistics and your supply chain and make sure that, you know, if I'm ordering rubber from Malaya, that's going to take 20 days to get here. Cause it's got to go by sea. If I'm ordering iron from Russia, there's a percentage that may fail quality control. And so, you know, I may not get everything I pay for. There's, you know, I might be buying or I might be completing my tanks and I've got to get them to the government so that they can actually use the things. Now I've got to factor in, am I sending them by rail? Am I sending them by, you know, by land? And like all of this factors into you hitting your, your targets of building your tanks on time, having the resources to do that. And then also like getting your tanks to the, to the supply, to, to the point where they need to be within the contract. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting biz simulation. That's really what it is. And I think it's, it's much deeper than any of the games that I've usually seen. Like usually the game dev tycoon style games are much more cartoony, much more free flowing time progresses way faster. They're much more simplified. Maybe they need to do that, do that a little bit in this game if they want to make it not be like a slog by the, by 1918. But yeah, I, I think it's a really awesome concept. I'm enjoying myself. Um, I guess we'll see where they go with it, but I don't know if I'd put a demo as my game of the year, but I'm trying to think of what my game of the year would be at this point because we're getting that time of year and I'm not sure yet. It's up there. Yeah, it's it, it's good. And I mean, it just, I, I think anytime a developer can layer unique but uh, complementing systems, kind of like you said with the, the business side that Sprocket is lacking, I mean, you can kind of see where you can put all this together. It's like having a cake. You get a cake and you put some frosting on it, it's better than a cake without frosting. You add some sprinkles, 
it's even better. You put it on a nice plate, you know, all these things enhance the overall experience. What I think will be interesting is seeing if they can nail that balance of including the right amount of things to make it really interesting and complex without including so much that it just becomes a grind and, you know, the gameplay loop bores you after a couple hours. Yeah, too much frosting is always bad. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, that'll be very tough. I mean, good luck to them. I'm really looking forward to any any future updates. I'm like, you know, I'm actually checking. I haven't been this excited about a game for a, oh, quite a long time, actually. Uh, I found myself actually checking Steam to see if, like, in my download section, any patch had come from the game because... Uh, I'm just I, I'm hoping that like tomorrow will be the day that uh, they expand to like 1915 or something or they increase the research options. So I'm looking forward to what comes next. Well, they're only 13 days as of recording this uh, into their what they only have 13 days left on their Kickstarter. Looks like they'll probably get to Germany, but that I don't think they're going to get to the U.S. So I really hope that they're not going to be like, nope, we didn't get to the Kickstarter. So America, not in the game. Did we talk about this, though? Like how what the heck is how is it that Microprose is involved in this? I mean, we did talk about this, but I, yeah, you really just don't understand um, how the what is the interplay there? I mean, a publisher, if a, if a game developer needs funding, typically the fund comes from the publisher. Like, like that's why you agree to sign away like 40% or 50% or whatever you're signing away in your royalties of your game to a publisher. The reason you do that is they're either helping you finance your game and taking a financial risk. And so you're compensating for that or they're doing something else for you. Um, if they're still doing a Kickstarter, I don't know. It's a little weird. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would hope that, um, I, I like in my head the way this all went down. You know, it's probably not reality. Is they had this Kickstarter all planned already, and maybe it was already up before they got the Microprose deal, and they just decided to go with it anyway for reasons that I'm not going to try to create for them. But I mean, just trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but then in my head, since they have Microprose, Microprose probably doesn't want to publish a game which is bad. So I hope that that means they'll give us those nations, whether or not they meet the, the the finance goals for those. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, they had been, I had, like I said, I'd been following it for a year, and they, they had been teasing the Kickstarter for a while, um, possibly before Microprose was engaged with them to sign it. So that, that wouldn't surprise me if, I, and I'm, I, I would bet that the Kickstarter had been planned before that, but... You know, I've seen I've seen developers do Kickstarters or tech demos or other things like that with the intention of luring a publisher in. I just haven't seen them just be like, we're going to do it anyway. Yeah, they definitely have all these nations as their flags. I'm looking at that the page. They have uh, they don't have, believe it or not, Russia or the USSR. But in their little graphic here, they do have Great Britain, France. Oh, never mind. They do have Russia. Just kidding. Yeah, I mean, I think it looks great. I think my main concern is just there's a lot to do on the business side, and there's a lot of different steps, but it's also very repetitive steps. So I think a shorter game in terms of length is probably the sweet spot than a we're going to cover 90 years of history at this level of detail. Um, But I guess we'll see. I mean, that's why they get paid the big bucks, right? Well, just for people who are listening, if you're intrigued by this at all, we've already mentioned this, but the, the demo is free, so just go check it out yourself. But I hope that this game gets developed and made in full since I'm having so much fun with it. So I agree with everything. Uber, do you have something else going on right now that you want to talk about? Well, um, you know, I guess the two kind of things. One is the Command Modern Operations Tournament that uh, we're running. That is still in the first round, the uh, first set of brackets. Um, the other kind of piece of news was Christopher Dean, the guy from NWS Wargaming, uh, passed away a few days ago. It seems like we've really lost uh, several folks this year that have been pretty instrumental in war games. Christopher Dean, you know, we lost John Tiller earlier this year, I believe. Um, I think there've been a couple other folks as well. I'm just not remembering off the top of my head, but it, it's been a, it's, it's been an unfortunate year in that regard. Yeah, it certainly has. And it, it is unfortunate and, uh, you know, hopefully the NWS community can keep all that rolling and we'll get more rule the waves in the future. Is there anywhere that folks can follow that command tournament? 
Uh, Matrix forums or the CMO Discord are the two places that all that's rolling down right now. So you guys figured out how to make it work with multiplayer then? Yeah, so it is a uh, it's a WeGo engine where basically you trade back and forth with a save game file and it swaps between one player to the next. And the phasing player can give orders and then they watch for the next 20 minutes as the orders play out. And then at the end of their turn, they can order or add new orders, and then it goes to the next player, and then for the next 20 minutes, they get to enter their orders and watch it, and it just goes back and forth. So it's it's we go, but it, it actually sounds kind of like I go, you go, right? Only one person is in charge for 20 minutes? Is that how I, is that correct, what I understood? Yeah, that's correct, but just the way that the, the patrol missions work and the strike missions, it's not like it's uh, you have to be in command. You can set up a mission area up and kind of trust that it's going to be prosecuted the way that you'd like. Right. Okay. I get it. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Right now they're fighting over Hawaii and there is a Saratoga carrier battle group on either side. And uh, for some added goals, if they bring a helicopter to a hover over some neutral locations, they can either take possession of a radar, a SOSUS bunker, or a SA-5 battery to kind of make things a little more interesting. Wait, a Saratoga on each side? Is this blue on blue? It is blue on blue. There's a red player and a blue player, but we didn't want to try to balance uh, two different orders of battle. You know, somebody's saying, well, the the Chinese carrier has this deficiency or the J-20 has this strength. So we just said, you know what? Everybody gets everything the same. I think the Ranger is on one side and the Saratoga is on the other. That's good because American Sam's suck. Yeah, yeah, they do. But uh, the the first match was concluded and it it sounds like everything's going good. So we're real hopeful. There's some prizes that are going to be given out, a copy of uh, Sutton's Covert Shores, and then Matrix is pitching in like 20 bucks for a gift card. Cool. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. I certainly hope so. I've enjoyed running it. And uh, Nick Masurka, the guy that came up with the Ike framework, has really been a pleasure to work with as well. Uh, I, I really hope that this is the first of many such tournaments. Thanks for coming on, Uber. I know it's been uh, a couple of episodes since we've had you on. It's been a few months since we've recorded one. Um, I'd love to have you on again in the future regarding Command and maybe other games. I think there's some interesting stuff going on in the war game space around professional versions whether it be john tiller stuff uh what he's done in the past or command pro uh, i think it's interesting to see the overlap in in sort of our hobby if you will uh between folks playing for fun and then those developers developing games for the government or other governments oh absolutely there's some huge growth especially with the, the u.s marine corps right now and it's really really exciting and hopefully we see this uh, spill over into the commercial games environment Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on. Uh, Tortuga, Eric, as always, thank you again. And uh, to everybody else, thanks for tuning in once again. We'll try to make it not be another four-month break between episodes. But until next time, this is Matt with Eric and Uber uh, saying thanks again for listening. And until next time, we're out. Thanks, folks. Goodbye.